The second most populated with the shawarma, like if you want the best shawarma, you got to go to New Jersey and Patterson. It's like being in okay. the Middle East. You walk there, it's like being in Palestine or being in Jordan. Wow. It's insane. Yeah. Everything. That's I walked cool. in a Chinese store one time and I asked for pork fried rice. Everybody turned their head and looked at me and wanted to kill me, bro. <laughs> that's, that's funny shit. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of funny shit, talk about it with Fran Jazz. Today we have two special guests. Returning co-host Michael Mukatosh. An actor, published author, screenwriter, producer, the list goes on, Jeffrey D. Calhoun. Oh, good job. Oh, well, thank you. It's awesome to be with you guys. Awesome, awesome. Thank you for being a, a guest on my show, my first ever yeah. Zoom podcast. Awesome, cool, man. You popped our cherry. Welcome, well, well, yeah, welcome, to the, welcome to the clan. <laughs> <laughs> I like it, I like it. Let's start off with, with with a with a little wellness check. How's everybody doing today? Jeffrey, go first. How you doing today? I'm doing good, man. I took my old man midday nap, so I'm ready to go. <laughs> Perfect. Oh man, it must be nice to have that kind of success in life. <laughs> <laughs> midday nap. I love Very it. Very blessed. Mike, Mike, how you doing today? I'm doing good, thank you. Awesome. Let's start off with where were you born? Uh, I was born uh, in the metro Detroit area. Oh, Detroit. Uh, Tough town. <laughs> from a woman. I did not fall from heaven. So I, I, am, a, I am a human creature. All right. I like it. All right. All right. That's, that's good. <laughs> Verifiable. We need a fact check Verifiable. on that one. <laughs> It's verified. I have a certification that states I was born. All right. All right. I like that. What, what originally piqued your interest in film? Um, I've been in, so film is my church, really. Like going to theaters were my church growing up. It was how I could get away from stress. It was where I could find moments of peace. It was always a very special thing for me. So I was always finding ways to go to the movie theater. Um, when I was like six years old uh, my mom took me to the theater and i saw S star wars uh, return of the jedi and it was just i don't know man it just hit me um i loved it and uh, ever since then so when by the time i could drive that's what i was doing i was going to the theater by myself i was um going to blockbuster or video stores and bringing home you know, three to six movies a weekend and um, and then just spending my time there watching. It's always been my escape. And, and also, you know, you even learn a lot from watching films. You learn a, lot about, learn a lot about yourself if you pay attention. So I would say that would be where my love for, quote, cinema would come from. Six years old. That's that's early on. That's how you know it's, it's really what you care about. You're still doing it. Yeah. Mike. Oh, yeah. Same question. Uh, my love for film? Yeah, when did it start? Do you remember? Oh, man, I hate to say, but I think mine started from either either having a, one of those illegal cable boxes, right, where <laughs> you get to watch everything. Awesome. Yeah. Or I think maybe sneaking into the movie theater on Central Avenue, the movie land. Those are so easy to get into. <laughs> the act of sneaking in made you fall in love with it. I mean, yeah. yeah, maybe, yeah, I think so. Just that, I don't know. It was just uh, that, and and that, and the. Um, I would say that really. I think that just the connection, uh, the larger than life uh, characters, you know, and then um, I would say the. The writing part, I like. I like a lot of the the background stuff, you know. Like my favorite wouldn't be the popular, the most popular. It would it would be you know something, you know, more technical. I would say. You remember the first movie you saw in the movie theater? Yeah, I think it was Batman, uh, the first, original Batman with Jack Nicholson and. Um, the eighty nine Batman. Eighty nine and Michael Keaton. That I didn't sneak into. <laughs> I remember sneaking into Jurassic Thanks Park, and. Um, and one of us got stuck outside. Then, then my boy, oh Rob, man, God rest his soul. Rob got stuck outside. He's the one that told us how to get in there. 
And then um, Victor was like, oh, don't worry about it. It's an hour and a half movie. <laughs> like, we'll get him eventually. <laughs> That's so funny. Nice. Yeah. Nice. All right. Um, what about yourself? <laughs> it's so funny. You guys got, like, big production movies. Mine was Selena. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> My sister oh, brought Oh, that's a made-for-TV movie, right? No, no. With J-Lo? Or did that come out in the theater? It was in the theater. Um, that my, was a theatrical? Yeah, oh, wow. my sister's 10 years older than me, so she wanted to go, just drag me along. I was probably around the same age, maybe six, but yeah. till this day, it's one of my favorite movies. I don't know if it's because it was my first in the movie theater, sure. or it was, just, it was just a great film. And till this day, my favorite films are based on a true story, documentary, stuff like that. Gotcha. So I don't know if that sparked it or what, but that, that's still a classic to me. I'm not even a J-Lo fan. I don't like her acting at all, but that movie is great. Yeah, I've heard that people really like that movie stands up. Yeah. Which which says a lot, you know, for for a movie that came out back then. Absolutely. If you had to choose one film to completely embody a perfect script, which one would it be? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I would say There's this movie I watched, and it's one of my favorite movies. It's called The Fountain, and it's a sci-fi film about life and death and about a man trying to beat death. Um, and it spans multiple generations as he's trying to beat death. And it's a real beautiful journey of a man going from, you know, I can outlive death. I, I do not accept loss. I'm a winner. I've won it every time to going through that arc of, of accepting his mortality and it's absolutely beautiful movie so i would say if you have a chance to watch the fountain i would say watch that one i think it's really solid it, it's it's dramatic so you know you're in for a you're in for the long haul on that one so your first movie and the one you'd say is the, is the best script are both sci-fi is that is it safe to say that's your favorite genre i love sci-fi um mostly because with sci-fi you can talk about things that are really happening in society you can talk about wage disparity you can talk about racism you can talk about sexism you can talk about any ism um, and you can touch on these topics in a human level through the mask of sci-fi because sci-fi makes it more palatable for an audience you don't trigger people with sci-fi Whereas if you go with a more, you know, classic dramatic route, it's easy to trigger an audience. Once an audience is triggered, their minds kind of shut off. They're no longer open to the message you're trying to deliver to them in order for them to face what they're going with. Whereas if we do something about 1984, where we talk about, you know, hey, uh, Big Brother is real. He's in your devices, he's watching you, he's stealing your metadata, and he's selling it to companies to control you, which is what's going on right now. And, and I'm not saying that in like a paranoia, paranoia conspiracy theory. I mean, it's just true, like everybody's admitted it. Um, uh, but everybody's fine with it. But if you, want, if you want to approach that topic, it's easier to approach that topic through sci-fi than it is to just approach it through a dramatic. So yes, I do like sci-fi for that ability. That's it. I never I never thought about it like that. That's it's pretty insightful. Yeah, that's that's kind of like talking about what's really happening without being specific about what's really happening. Absolutely, like absolutely. It. That that's a, that's the greatest thing you can do with sci-fi is is really show that. Like, what is your favorite sci-fi film? If I've seen it, maybe I can comment on it. What's your favorite? I would say one of my favorites. Uh, I don't know if it qualifies. Demolition Man. Does that qualify? Yeah. So Demolition Man, so look at it, right? What is that What is that quote utopia? The utopia of Demolition Man is actually a dystopia. So it's, again, it's about class disparity in Demolition Man. I'm going to take you to Taco Bell, right? He takes you to Taco Bell. It's this super fancy five-star Michelin restaurant where only the select 1% of the population have access to it right and where's the rest of the population who are not the top one percent they're living in the sewers they're eating rats yeah, rat burgers. right so yeah. what are you looking at right now you're looking at end-stage capitalism 
that's hidden behind an action sci-fi film of Wesley Snipes and a jacked up Sly Stallone. But you get to do all of that through sci-fi, right? Yeah. Yeah, that, that, yeah that's pretty interesting. Same thing with um, one of the Dawn of the Dead movies. I don't, I don't know. It wasn't Dawn of the Dead. It was, I think, I don't know, one of the dead. The Return of the Living Dead, I think the, uh, the sure. one. Yeah, the, the one with John Leguizano. Same thing. Yeah, that's the same. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, classism, yeah. absolutely. Um, but if you want to go to Night of the Living Dead, I mean, George Romero tells you that film is about racism. That film is about racism. And so if you really go and you watch Night of the Living Dead, you can see it. So it is really, um, you know, and, th- and that's horror, being being able to kind of hide that message, but it's there. Yeah. Um, and uh, and it's really important to be able to do that um, through, the, through the genre, but not be, you know, hammering that theme into somebody's head. Just, just gently, just kind of pushing, just kind of suggesting, but you don't want to, kill them with the theme because then they're like oh this movie's terrible right then you turn into like v for vendetta where it's excessive and all you can think about is the theme and you're not actually enjoying the movie yeah it's like one of those religious guys that try to convert you no matter what like show me (laughs) right like show me don't tell me yeah exactly you're like bro give me a second here man let me breathe yeah (laughs) you know what i do when a jehovah witnesses knock on my door i used to try to convert them and they would run away that's (laughs) funny We had somebody in a in a, one of our neighborhoods um, would invite them in and sit them down, and then grill them for like an hour because I guess I didn't know this, but Jehovah's only have so much time to work the block. So if if you bring them into your room and you set them down, you're taking up their time. They can't go to your neighbors. So this this dude would bring them in and then just do the whole neighborhood a solid, which I thought was fantastic. <laughs> you know, then you have guys in, in, in their little white shirts and their backpacks trying to get out of his house so they can work the block, but now they can't because he's there and he's, you know, so, I mean, that's selfless right there. That's a saint. Uh, that, that, that's, that's real community service right there. Yeah. <laughs> it's taking one for the whole community. I love it. Yeah, definitely. What do you enjoy most when you're watching a movie? Is it the production, the acting, the editing, the cinematography, or do you look deeper the at, and the writing? I really care about, am I invested in this character? Like, if I'm invested in the character, you can forgive a lot with a film. It can be a low-budget film, but if I care about this character, um, then I'll sit through it. But if I'm watching this film, and even if it's shot really well, sound is great, you know, cinematography's on point, you know, they they color corrected it, everything, it looks professional, but I don't give a shit about anybody on the screen. Uh, Why am I here? Like, that's a problem. So really creating a character through, um, the writing is great, but but having a character who is sympathetic or empathetic that I can somehow on some level identify with their journey, now you have me. And um, so I, w- I would say, yeah, character is is what's going to get me through it. And part of that comes from the performance of the actor, of course. I mean, you can have... Listen, I've read some great scripts that I was like, man, I can't wait to see this script made. And then it gets made, and I was like, oh, boy. Like, the actor misses the mark, the production isn't great. So you can have a great script get ruined by a bad production. But um, you can't have, and I think it's actually Hitchcock. I think I'm literally quoting Hitchcock now. Um, you, can, you, can, you can't save a bad script with a good movie, but you can save... You, you can you can ruin a good script with a bad movie. I think that's a, a loose Hitchcock quote that quote there, if that helps. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. Um, I I was I was it reminds me of in your book in the successful screenwriter, you said they they come for the concept but they'll stay for the the character. I believe. Right? Yeah, that's that's absolutely right. Concept is is um, so you're talking like the guide for every screenwriter. So in my in my book, concept is like what hooks the what's the hooks the person like hooks their interest um you know it's it's uh it's a guy who's a cop and he's obsessed with this killer 
and they both get frozen and sent through time into the future. Okay. But the cop is stuck in the old ways and having to deal with this politically correct, you know, alternative future. Now you stick around for that because you want to see how this old school guy ends up, you know, wiping his ass essentially with parking tickets because it's a totally crazy thing, you know, or, or wants to be intimate the old fashioned way instead of a fancy headset. So, you know, it, you, you, you get drawn in by the concept, but you stick around for the character and it's absolutely right. Yeah. I like that book. I should read it. <laughs> it's a good one. You can even listen to it on Amazon audible. <laughs> this is a shameless plug, ladies and gentlemen. No, honestly, awesome. it's, I, I really love that book. That was the first book I picked up on screenwriting even for school, I didn't pick up the book when I took a screenwriting course years ago as an elective. Yeah. I didn't buy the book. But then my first book ever was your book. And uh -huh. Thank yeah, you. And I enjoyed it a lot. I think it was uh, you simplified everything. You condensed everything. Uh, you gave the, the PDFs. The attachments are incredible. I mean, you get like... Thank you. It's like getting like almost like a small pamphlet. Even it, He even shows you how to... Uh, like technically write the script in terms of like the structure and the, like the way you're supposed to write your slug line and and we'll do's yeah. and don'ts uh, which i like a lot um the examples you even go through the beats and i i believe you uh, you outline nine of them if i recall right yeah yeah i've got like nine plot points yeah the nine plot points and you you plug you took primarily from um sid field's book correct yeah and then you i'd say yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. So kind of like like a Bruce Lee type, I'm going to take the best from everything and put it together, and, and this is what it is, right? No, that's absolutely right. So, like, my biggest thing is, because I've been writing, I want to actually say for 20 years, writing for 20 years, but I'm taking it serious for a little over 10. Um, and I've so I've learned from everybody. I've read, I, you know, I have a whole lot, a library of screenwriting books. Most of them are behind me. I've taken like all the seminars, classes, online course, master courses. I've done all this stuff, all of this, you know, self-taught stuff. And the one thing that always drove me nuts was that if I wanted to go refresh on something or look something up, I got to go through twenty books behind me. And it drove me crazy. I was like, why can't all of this stuff just be in one quick guide that you can reference? It doesn't exist. So I was like, that's fine. I was teaching my seminars and somebody said, I wish you had this in a book. And I thought, well, I mean, I could do that. So I took all my seminars and everything I've learned and I, I shrunk them into my book and I wrote it specifically not to be textbooky because textbooky screenwriting books drive me crazy because you can get boring, you can fall asleep. I want to know to the point what is going on. So I took a screenwriter's approach to it of wordsmithing, of being the most efficient way of writing this possible instead of trying to you know impress you with fluff of how brilliant I am. How do I just simplify this down so it's a quick reference guide? Um, and so so we were able to to kind of do that. And I'm a visual learner because I'm dyslexic. So all of the graphs and stuff you see in there is just that's how my mind sees it. Um, so I put it in there and it was always very successful in my seminars. So I put my graphs and my templates in my book. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of a template because of people who are like, you know, how do I write this drama? I go, here's, you know, here's a template for a drama. Now you know how to write the drama. And then you can go from that drama and start kind of branching out into your own. Sid Field's always been my guy. I just... His book was the first book I ever read that really made sense to me. So I took that book and then I took, you know, several other books, Christopher Vogler's book, you know, McKee's book, um, Linda Seeger, um, just a whole bunch. And I, what I wanted to do was take all of these greats and make that amalgamation that you're speaking about. Um, but then also have those references from their books within my book so that should you choose to learn beyond what I have to teach, you can do that. And so I'll say, like, you know, if you want more on this, you can go to McKee's book. If you want more on this, Archetypes, you can go to Vogler's book, you know. Yeah, and I'm, and I'm, so I, I wanted to provide that opportunity. And then my big, big thing is subplots. Because subplots, you can't really find anywhere. Nobody really 
talks about subplots. So when I was able to break down subplots on where they fall, what they are, and how they interact with the main storyline at specific points, I mean, when I was teaching that in my seminars, people's eyes would light up. Um, and so being able to put that in book form was a must. And I mean, that's one of the reasons why it became one of the best um, screenwriting books of all time by the Book Authority. Awesome. I love hearing that. And uh, number one seller. I, uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. Right? Yeah, I, li I like that. Uh, God bless. I mean, that, that's nice to see. And and you, you, you give props to all the to people that came before you, and it shows you're a student of the game. You're not just you know, trying to run with it and, and act like you reinvented the wheel. Like, like you said in the book, you're not trying to reinvent the real wheel, but you like efficiency, and that's pretty yeah. damn efficient, uh, the way you collect that. What are your thoughts on on Blake Snyder's Save the Cat? You didn't mention him in that list. So so I have some uh, references to Snyder. Um, so, uh, he, you know, he has a 15-point thing. Uh, so it, it all comes down to... Um, to Joseph Campbell's The Hero's Journey, right? So Joseph Campbell in, came out with this book, The Hero's Journey, which is about how all of mythology's religions across the globe all have the same mythological journey. And he breaks all of that down. And so once that was kind of discovered and disseminated to the populace, right, what happened was other screenwriting gurus started taking on bits and pieces of that and then watering it down essentially into, well, here's my, you know, here's my plot beats. And, you know, these are my 15 point beat sheet like Blake Snyder has. But, but the truth of the fact is, is like none of it is original. Like Blake Snyder, you know, came up with that, but it all comes from the hero's journey right? Christopher Vogler did the same thing with the writer's journey. He, he says, this is a writer's journey that comes from the hero's journey. Sid Field did the same thing. Um, every, all of them have, they've all, it's all come from the monomyth essentially that, uh, Joseph Campbell, you know, discovered. And so, um, I, I do have some, some bits and pieces in from Snyder too. And I, and I acknowledge that. I mean, it is, it is one of the biggest, you know, screenwriting books out there that, dominated the field for 20 years. Um, so of course, but what I like to say in my book, you know, is that none of this is original. Like what's going on is certain bits and pieces from the monomyth somebody liked and then to put that into their system, but they didn't create the system. Yeah. They might've re they might've renamed it. Um, and so I really try and, and pay homage and respect to that because it's important to know source and where source material comes from. And if I go on here and I say, these are the nine pop plot points, this is what's perfect. This is how you do it. And I claim to have invented it. I mean, I'm just straight up lying. You need to honor what came before you if you're going to actually take this like to the next level. Um, and the other thing what's happened over the years from the monomyth into like nowadays is really the plot points are becoming it's like a, it's like reduction, right? It was originally this many, then it was 15, you know, mine are nine. So like it's, it's getting more efficient essentially with the plot points. And some people's complaint about that is it's leading to uh, films all having the same plot and being predictable. And that is a valid argument. Um, what I try and do with my plot points, the way that I've set them up is try and free your mind so that way you have your guideposts, but in between of these sections, you have this free form creativity that you can get in there and be original with it. So that's, that's my take on it. That's beautiful. <clears throat> I recently have been learning about how exactly what you said about your book, where write something that you would have benefited from if you came across it. Don't try to just write the next bestseller or whatever your, your, your goal is. Just write what you would have loved to come across where it would have been explained in a, in a, in a simple way. And that's exactly yeah. what you did. That's beautiful. I like that. Yeah, absolutely. What are your top five favorite movies? 
Oh man, I don't have them written down, dude. Uh, <laughs> not in order. <laughs> yeah, the order doesn't matter. I, let me refer to my top five list. I mean, so the fountains on there, obviously, because I spoke about that. Yeah. Um, I love Star Wars movies. Um, Return of the Jedi is one of my favorite. I get a lot of hard time for this, and it's not because. You know, Return of the Jedi is the best film ever, but for me, it's just emotionally resonates with with a significant moment in my childhood. Um, uh, I don't have like a. I'm just trying to think of films I've seen that. I I mean I can't say top five, but I'm just gonna name off films that I've I've watched and rewatched. Um, Kingdom of Heaven by Ridley Scott, I think, is a fantastic film that is ex- exceptionally underrated. Uh, Beautiful Journey, a very emotional film. Um, I love Tucker and Dale. It's, to me, some of the best horror comedy out there um, that, again, created this new version of a horror comedy which hasn't been done before, kind of like The Cabin. Um, I think that's three or four films and a fifth film. I'm going to say the sixth sense, uh, because that is the movie I took my wife to, which tricked her into dating me. So I'm going to go with that one. Oh, so you're a magician uh, too. We're going to add that in the thing. <laughs> I enacted a plan to get this lady and it started with taking her to a scary movie. I literally looked up scariest movie out right now and uh, it was the sixth sense. And then I was like, Hey, it's sweetest day. You want to go see a movie? Uh, neither of us have dates. And she was like, yeah. And I was like, great. I was like, scariest movie out right now. Right, let's go. <laughs> I took her to that. And, and, and why is and, that? Uh, so she could hold your hand tighter or something? I mean, I'm just saying I just wanted to make sure the lady wanted to be close, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so it worked out. worked out really well oh, 23 years later. So that's what I give you. But uh, I'm not like a guy who's going to be like, oh, you know, um, you know, China, um, um, any anything like that. So you know, uh, I just uh, I don't um, I don't I'm, I'm not going to be like oh Casablanca. You know, I'm, just not, <laughs> I'm not I'm not that screenwriter who's, who's coming out there and and uh, and doing that because I've watched them and and they're great classics, but um, you know. So, what is your favorite genre of movies to watch? And what is your favorite genre of movies to write? Yeah, I do love writing. I, I do love watching sci-fi because we already talked about that. Um, I, I'll i tell you my least favorite is um, is the torture genre. I have a real hard time with that. Um, I like. I thought Saw was brilliant, but I never need to see anything else like that again. Um, yeah, like, I was just like, you know, it's a one and done. Thanks, James Wan. Punching out, clocking out. I don't ever need to see this genre again. Um, but yeah, I, I like I like um, sci-fi. For me, I'm not limited to genre. So when it comes to like, what genre do I like? It, it's like to write, it doesn't matter. Um, what matters to me is am I being challenged? Um, because I'm always going to put in a little bit of comedy into anything I write, whether it's a hard drama, horror, sci-fi, because comedy is necessary. Um, and I'll explain it in a minute. If I forget, please bring it up. But um, I need to be challenged. I need a producer um, or somebody I'm working with to give me, you know, a project and then make it as hard as hell for me because then I light up. There's something wrong with me where if if a, if a producer says, I need you to do this. Oh, and I can only have two locations. Oh, and we don't have budget for this. Oh, and we can only have this kind of character. I, I, I love it. Like the tighter and smaller of a box you put me in, the harder it is to write. The more challenging it is, the more motivated I am, the more I love it. Um, I'll think about it. I won't even sleep. I'll be like, oh, I can do that. I'll wake up in the middle of the night. I'll come to the computer and write. Um, so I love to be challenged. Um, but the uh, he puts the reason the why I like to song do in the comedy. background and shit when he's oh, writing. Sorry, go ahead. Go As ahead. you put the eye of the tiger song in the background when you're writing. <laughs> yeah. Well, just, you know, I like to know what my sandbox is that I can play in. And if I have a very specific sandbox, now I have parameters. Once I have parameters I can work within, it takes all the guesswork out. 
Like the worst thing you could tell me is Jeffrey, I want you to write whatever screenplay you want, go. And then I'm going to sit here and be like, Jesus, I mean, what am I going to write now? I could write anything. And I'm like, I don't want that. I want to know what my limitations are because that fires my creative center. Um, uh, but the reason why I like to put in little comedic bits is because um, you want peaks and valleys, essentially, when you're when you're doing uh, a screenplay. You want to have the audience being emotionally manipulated throughout the whole thing. So I want them scared. I want dramatic conflict and I want to really hit them hard or be or before I hit them hard with a big moment I bring in a bit of levity and it's all to kind of manipulate the 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 journey of the audience not just of the character keeps them interested if I'm only doing laughs 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 for 90 minutes you lose the audience if I'm only doing torture for 90 minutes you lose the audience same thing with drama you have to have in all of these little different aspects of tone within that genre to keep the audience interested. I believe Robert McKee says if one is like an uh, an up, the second scene should be down and it should keep going yeah. opposite, right? Yeah, he likes to use values. So he calls it positive and negative values. It kind of makes it a little bit more mathematical. But yeah, actually, just think of peaks and valleys. If you think yeah. of peaks and valleys, um, he does have a great point about, you know, never leaving a scene tonally the same way you started. I think that's great. It's, it's, it's brilliant. So if you come in soft, leave softer or leave harder, but don't leave soft. And I, and I always think that is a really great way to like, look at your scenes. If you go back to your scenes, look at all of your scenes and be like, am I leaving different than the way it came in? Because that keeps the momentum going. I yeah. like it. I like it. Yeah. I think, um, I, I, I think it's from his book, uh, where, you would mark the end of, you know, if you have them like all in bullet points, and then you would mark, mm -hmm. and then you flip the page over, and you see does it go high, low, and if it doesn't look like like a heart monitor type thing, then you got a problem. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you want to have it up and down, definitely. Yeah, if yeah. It doesn't and, and, look there, like and there's a so many like that. That's how he does it. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's good. Yeah. If it doesn't look like a heart monitor, you got a problem. <laughs> it sounds good, exactly. right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, if you're flatlined, you're dope. Yeah. Yeah. If you're yeah. flatlined, you're fucked. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like it. Oh, man. All right. Uh, we have six, six questions that we're going to ask rapid fire. It's choose one or the other. It's only six of them. I feel, I feel like right now what you're doing is like you're fishing for my password. You're like, so what was your favorite dog's name? What was your first pet's name? What was your brother's name? By the way, what high so, school uh, you went to? Uh, <laughs> what was your mascot? Your high school mascot. What was it? What, was, what year were you born? <laughs> I like that. Yeah, put your palm up All against right. the screen for me for 10 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> That's you hilarious. Like fucking eyeball in the middle. Yeah. Like, I don't know. We got it. We got this one. We're going to get this guy's Netflix account. You just wait. Uh, <laughs> right, I'm going to stop putting We're, the, we're down. the money, guys. <laughs> uh, awesome. All right. It's just six of them. The first right, one man. is. Here we go. Let's do it. DiCaprio or Denzel? Better actor. Denzel. Oh, my man. Yeah, I think so, too. I think so, too. Um, Arnold Schwarzenegger or Sylvester Stallone? Stallone. Stallone writes. Oh, Stallone wow. writes all of his films. Oh, I like that one. Great. That's a great reason to choose yeah, him. Yeah, he wrote, he wrote Rocky. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And then he refused to get bought out of it. Oh, yeah. The guy's a... Yeah. I love that he yeah, he, he adds the um, like hope is a big deal to him, and it really shows in all of his characters. It's a universal truth, man. Like if you write about hope in anything, we all want to be hopeful. So yeah. you know, you write about that, um, you're grabbing everybody, and and yeah, that is his secret. Like those universal truths that you can tap into: hope, loss, love. I mean, it's, it's stuff's infinite. That's why like, every song you hear is about one of those. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like it. Yeah, you're right. All right, next we have <laughs> Jackie Chan or Jean Claude Van Damme. It's Jackie Chan, guys. I mean, come on. Oh, come right. on. <laughs> yeah, 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 we're going to edit this I one out. For, I, did, I did Kung Fu for 10 years. Oh, yeah, I was so going to say, Chan. you're a Kung Fu guy, right? You're a martial artist. Oh, yeah. 
10, yeah, I had to retire when my knee gave out, but I did, I did Kung Fu for 10 years. And then I did the Iaido for another 10, which is Japanese swordsmanship. Wow. So yeah, Jackie Chan, Jackie Chan's incredible, man. We got to add that to, to his next intro. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Number four. Yeah. Comedian, magician, date, uh, date, Retired dating martial coach. Artist. <laughs> martial artist. Number, uh, Number four. Number four, we got Al Pacino or Robert De Niro. I'm going to go with De Niro, but that is a really close. I mean, Pacino's great. My thing is Pacino's Pacino and everything. <laughs> um, and and De Niro does kind of, you know, change to the role, right? Like if you look at Taxi Cab Driver, you know, but Pacino's always Pacino. Yeah. So, yeah. You're right. <laughs> I like the way you think, man. You got you got a, a brilliant mind, bro. That's why I lost the hair, bro. I mean, I just <laughs> pushed all of it out, you know? I'm like a like a like a super villain over here. I lost yeah. my hair, but I can screen right. <laughs> All right. Next we have Blake Snyder or Robert McKee. Uh I I think McKee. Um but but again Snyder w- wrote a book that was huge in the in- I mean in in literally changed the industry for 20 plus years i mean how to train a dragon put a thank you to blake snyder and save the cat in their credits so it's a very influential book so no shade to snyder i think mckee um yeah just just the guy is is a living legend and having been to his seminar and sitting there and being challenged and watching my perspective grow on the craft, I would say McKee. Yeah. Yeah. Classic horror villains or modern day horror villains? Um, I like classic horror villains. Yeah, like old school Dracula. Yeah, like Dracula. You wrote something, a short with vamp i saw um yeah yeah but the old school yeah like oh i didn't write that no i i produced it i i just came in with i just came in with a little bit of money i didn't i didn't actually i didn't write write that i just came i just was a producer on that yeah but um no i like classic villains man i like i like old school um creature from the black lagoon um dracula frankenstein uh, we could go even old school monsters like King Kong. I I cried at the end of King Kong. It was the first movie I ever cried at was King Kong. I was embarrassed, but I can own it now because I'm a grown man. <laughs> so, but um, but yeah, I'd say old school. I almost cried when Mufasa died. Almost. I did. You did? Yep. Yeah. yeah. I was a little older than you. Yeah. So Vo- so Christopher Vogler wrote that, right? In the Writer's Journey. So he, he worked with um, with Disney on The Lion King. He's been wow. on my show a few times. Brilliant guy. Wow. Brilliant guy. And he talks about the scene where uh, where the the baby is born and he holds it out and the son hits it. Um, and on my show, he's like, "Yeah." So I ran over to the uh, ran over to the artists and I was like, "Can we have the son hit the hit the line as 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 he's held out above the audience?" And, Oh. And uh, they're like, yeah. And then they had to spend thousands of dollars reanimating that scene because they were done with it. <laughs> Everybody that got a newborn baby picked them up at one point yeah. like Simba, right? <laughs> I done yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's so funny. Oh, the last question. Uh, what, series, writing for series or writing uh, movies? Like series TV? or or I have, yeah, no, yeah. So writing features or writing um, television? Yeah. God, see, I want to answer that with the question. I'm going to say um, features because I love features. But I would answer that with a question. Like if, for any writers out there who are listening to this or any future writers out there who are listening, how do I just hijack this podcast from you? Is, is that okay, Francisco? I'll just take this. <laughs> I'd be honored. I'd be Sorry. honored. Give my viewers, I, I say- <laughs> drop as many gems on my viewers as possible. The floor is yours. So, so with that, I would say, what do you want? Right. Because I, I say writers come to me. I'm looking for a career as a writer and I go, great, go into television because writing features is awesome. I love writing features, but it's hard to get one feet to get on one feature 
let alone multiple features a year to be able to make a living. If you can get staffed on television, at least you've got a, a job for as long as the show is on the air, right? Once the show is off the air, you're on a new career again. You have to find another show. Um, but if you're young, if you're in your young 20s and you can be an assistant and work your way up in a room, I, I would say go for television. But I, I love features, man. man. I'm a movie guy. I like it. When you were a kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? <laughs> like, so tacky. I wanted to be a marine biologist. I did not know what that was. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just to be very clear, I did not know what that was. It was just a fancy term. <laughs> and I don't even really like swimming or water, but I did have a fish. So, <laughs> marine biologist, that's like, it's it's so ridiculous. Um, not like my kid who knows exactly what he wants to be and will be that. I was I was just floating. I, I never thought in a million years I would end up uh, being a writer, especially since I, I grew up, you know, dyslexic. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you know, the aspirations of children. Children don't know anything. <laughs> so. What do you think about the influence Marvel had on cinema in the last, uh, what is it, 15 years? I think it's impressive considering like I remember the days when Marvel was flat broke and they had no money and they were selling off bits and pieces of their franchises to stay afloat. I remember those days. Um, so as a kid, we would fan cast movies, you know, like what about Hulk Hogan as Wolverine? No, he'd be more like the beast. I don't think he'd be like Wolverine though. Like we would just fan cast these films. Yeah. Um, but then when, when singers X-Men came out, I mean, we were all blown away. And, um, but it's actually a film I saw called dark city, which I don't know if you've ever seen it, but dark city was fantastic. And in that film, they did a bunch of, um, uh, special effects. When, when I saw that, I said, they can do superhero films now. And then shortly after that, X-Men came out, Spider-Man. Um, so I think when they really rolled the bet on uh, John Favreau and Robert Downey Jr. and an unfinished script and said, here's some money, make a movie. I mean, that was a make or break moment. If it didn't work out, Marvel Studios would not exist really at all. I think they would have closed. Um, but... Robert Downey Jr.'s ability to improv, John Favreau's pure skill at filmmaking. The guy is incredible and does not get enough praise in the industry. He really does. And people go, oh, John Favreau. I'm like, no, you guys do not understand. This guy is one of the modern, most brilliant filmmakers out there, period. He is incredible. Um, and they just think, oh, he, he's revitalized Star Wars. Yes. Why do you think that is? The guy's a master. So um, he's just heaps of praise on that, on that man. Incredible. Um, so those guys coming together and being able to pull it out. Yeah, it, it created this this Marvel monster that we have now. And, and, and to, to my benefit, I mean, I, I love Marvel films. I saw the Marvels. No complaints, no shade. And I understand that that's um, not cool. Everybody wants to hate on on Marvel movies. But I think because superhero fatigue is real, people struggle with anything that comes out, they have to hate it. But if you can actually just sit down and leave all of your biases at the door, you will enjoy the experience. I thought Quantumania was great. It had an awesome... A dramatic component to it. It hit several universal truths. Um, they made characters human in unexpected ways. Um, but everybody's like, but the notes you get are like, well, the CGI was kind of rough. And I'm like, bro, you just watched Quantum Mania. You just got to watch Ant Man <laughs> in the quantum realm. That would not have happened 20 years ago where it didn't look like everybody was in cardboard boxes. And you're complaining about the special effects and you totally missed the story. And the story was there. And I'll go 12 rounds with anybody if they want to complain about the story. There was a scene in Quantum Mania where um, the buildings are alive, okay? And the buildings are help fighting off everybody. And there's a scene in Quantum Mania where they show one of the buildings embracing another building that's been killed. And it touched my heart. 
it was so sad the way they did it. And they were so subtle with showing the relationship of just these background character buildings, but they took the time to build it. So when one of the buildings is killed, there's a little bit of an emotional moment there that you can have if you're able to leave your biases at the door and sit for the film. So that's that's my two cents. That's dope. I like that. I, I enjoy the Marvel movies. Uh, I have a follow-up question, though. So they've been declining mm -hmm. lately. And do you think it's because, to your point before, it's the character that makes the movie and Robert Downey Jr. was such a, like, like born to be Iron Man in the movies? Yeah. And is it because of, do you think because he's gone and they roll him off? Or do you think it's maybe because of the, the wokeness that they're putting into the Marvel movies? Or do you think it's a combination of both or neither? I don't have any problem with representation or authenticity. I think if you want to have representation, it's important to show that and important to show the story. Like, um, like if I look at like Black Panther, I mean, Wakanda Forever, that, that's powerful. Absolutely incredible. And Black Panther was a solid film. I mean, you have two characters that um, are African, one African-American lives that African-American experience, one an African prince. So they're complete opposites. And so you put those two in a movie together and the one who's an African-American who lived that life becomes the African prince and is pissed at the African prince because he allows his African country to stay hidden and not embrace the community. That's a legitimate argument, but yet this guy's a villain. So by the end of that film, he dies, but he, inf he causes a change in Chadwick Boseman's character, right? Where he opens up the doors of Wakanda. So now you have an antagonistic villain character who creates a change to who makes the central character better. That's a solid story. Yeah. Right? You can call it as woke as you want, but it's there. It's real. It's a story and it matters and it should be heard. Miss Marvel is, you know, a female centric um, story. Um, based on uh, family. And Captain Marvel is all about family from the first one to the second one. And I think that theme hits, and there's nothing wrong with showing that. So, like, I, I quote woke, I don't really, that doesn't, that doesn't affect me at all. What affects me is how was the story? Make it as woke as you want. If the story is there with universal truths, um, that's fine to me. But no, I think the superhero fatigue is real, no different than when people got tired of the jacked up heroes from the late eighties into nineties. Those all fell out of favor because people are tired of seeing it. The same thing with the old man action hero in the aughts, you know, after taken, you had every guy over 55 with arthritis was saving people <laughs> with a handgun. So, you know, the same people, people got, people got sick of that as well. And so you're not seeing that anymore. Well, it's the same with superhero films. Superhero films have been around 20 years. It's a long time to be in the market. So, yes, we are kind of hitting that point to where superhero films are going to need to be further and farther apart between to give audiences more time to um, uh, uh, kind of get used or, or more time to develop that demand again instead of constantly hitting them with another one, another one, another one. Now, what Marvel does, which is smart, is that with each superhero film that comes out, they change the tone, and that is really important. So they're not all like The Dark Knight, where it's just, hey, let's make another Zack Snyder film in the exact same tone. Nobody wants that. But if you have, like, the original Ant-Man was a heist film, right? Um, Captain America Winter Soldier was a, was a political thriller. Um, so you have all of these different types of, of Marvel films and they have their, their different genre that they work in that revitalizes the franchise for that moment. You know, the first Thor was a hard drama by Kenneth Branagh, right? Second Thor was even darker and they realized, oh, this isn't good. We're losing audience. We went too dark. That didn't work. What else can we do? You have Taika Waititi comes in, makes it a comedy and it's freaking hilarious. But then they double down on Love and Thunder, 
they go too far with the comedy to where now they had literal memes in the comedy of screaming goats. That didn't work. They realized, okay, we pushed it too far. So if there's a Thor fight, they're going to have to tweak the genre again into a different tone to regain the audience. Is genre what you mean by in your book where you say, what voice are you telling the story in? Yes. What, like that's the tone, exactly. that's the genre? Yep. Are, are we telling it in a funny voice? Or are we telling it in a serious voice? Mm-hmm. What is what is the kind of tone that we're going for? Absolutely. All right. Last question is going to be a heavy one. Okay. <laughs> in reference to the strikes and AI, what do you really feel is the future of writing, film, and all the above? Yeah, AI is not going to go anywhere. I know... I know people feel like, oh, AI is dead. We put a nail in the coffin. It's not. It's it's coming. Um, I've been fortunate enough to interview, I want to say, two different AI software developers on my podcast, The Successful Screenwriter. And both of them take the approach of essentially using AI to create word prompting or scene prompting while you're writing to me i think that is like the perfect hybrid of like michael you're sitting down and you're writing a script right um and then you hit a scene and you're stuck and you're like i don't really know where to go you go over to your little ai windows clippy and you say hey clippy i have a trouble with this you know scene what do you think and then that scene that ai kind of gives you prompts and then you can work with that and go back to writing script i think that is a great direction um, for where we could be with AI. So you don't think it's going to ruin anything? You think it's only going to help? I mean, I'm an optimist. I'd like to. I'd like to think it would make things um, better that way. Making sure writers still have jobs, you know. Otherwise, I'll just switch my podcast for you know AI writers. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, right. Uh, you know, you I to, could do that and just like talk to robots all day. All right, AI writers. So, um, but no, I I think that um, I mean, if you say, hey, will a will a AI be able to write a script, a screenplay that's not verbal trash uh, or word salad? Would you Would you think that happened? I say absolutely. It's just a matter of time. I mean, I play with ChatGPT and. Um, you can the stuff that that it comes out with is absolutely incredible um and watching it work is is fascinating so uh i think ai would absolutely 100 percent be able to write screenplays in the future and i don't even think that long from now the yeah. strikes luckily have really um, put a lot of limitations on what ai can do but i think eventually we'll see some kind of a hybrid where writers are working with like ai software tools to aid with um, they're writing instead of replacing them with. I agree. AI isn't going anywhere. So we might no, as well just yeah. use it, you know. Yeah. The successful Yeah, I mean, get your, get your stock in Skynet. You know, I always thank my Roomba every day. Um, I'd be like, you're doing a great job, little guy. Really cleaning up. Please don't kill me in my sleep. <laughs> so, you know, I just really, really like to let, like, let any, any of the little electronic things know that, you know, I'm one of the nice ones. Okay, you you don't have to kill this one. <laughs> so the successful screenwriter book, great book on Audible in the bookstores. Also the, the website. Guide, it's, it's the it's the guide for every screenwriter. The guide for every screenwriter. I'm sorry. And yep, the success. That's okay. And and the website is the successful screenwriter. Correct. Yeah, uh, you that, got it, man. That has some good tools on it, um, uh, including to uh, help write a log line and some videos. Yeah. And I like the cause and effect video, the Akashi diagram video that you have where you can break Thank down. Thank you. Yeah, the problem. I, I like that a lot. And um, the you also have a screenwriting contest on that book, on that website, correct? Yeah, so Script Summit. Um, Script Summit is exclusive to Coverfly now. And uh, you can go on Script Summit and... Um, 
scriptsummit.com or you can go on Coverfly and look us up. Coverfly is huge in the indie screenwriting community. Lots of lots of street cred. Um, right now, we actually have a special. So we're doing the early bird deadline. So our early bird deadline is in two days. So if you submit before the 17th, I'm not sure when this airs, but if you submit before the 17th, you'll save $20, which is a big deal. I really try and keep the costs low up front. Screenwriting contests are expensive. So I do an early bird special for any of the writers out there where it's like, you know, it's too expensive for me to submit. And I'm like, well, submit now because it's only 40 bucks. So get it in now instead of later when it's, you know, 60 bucks. Um, so people can really take advantage of that. And our writers who have won the contest have had their scripts pitched to like Bloomhouse Pictures. I mean, everybody knows Bloomhouse. Um, they've had, we've had writers who have won contracts with talent managers. Um, and we've had writers who get Coverfly development packages. So this is really sweet. So Coverfly comes in and actually works with you on how to get your script to where it needs to be, fix your pitch, make a deck, get everything ready, introduce you to industry contacts like managers, like producers, and they really do everything they can to help make you successful. Um, and that's that's really the reason why we, we've partnered with, with Coverfly to be exclusive with them and make that happen. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. I like that. Love it. Um, we're nearing the end. If you could just let our okay. our viewers know where they can find you, any advice you yeah. like to drop on them, and uh, anything you have coming up that you like to share. The floor is yours. Thanks, man. Yeah. All right. So uh, you can find me on Instagram at Screenwriter Pod. Uh, very easy to do at Screenwriter Pod on the IG because I'm a hip like those kids. Hello, fellow children. <laughs> and um, you can you can go to thesuccessofscreenwriter.com uh, is my website. Uh, Script Summit is the contest, and the book is the guide for every screenwriter. And um, yeah, yeah, I think that's it, man. And we fix my scripts. Is that a website, or that's within the the uh, website? We fix, yeah. So we fix your script. So we fix your script dot com is my website where you can go on there. And if you want to do like a one on one with me and sit down for like an hour and discuss the industry, uh, you can do that. You can you can book a time with me. We can hang out for an hour. We can talk about industry. Um, you can send me your script. I can give you notes uh, and mentor clients. Um, I've mentored some clients. One of the clients I mentored ended up winning Nichols, which is the most prominent screenwriting country in the world. Um, I'm not taking credit for that, but I'm just saying like I I, I worked with them and um, and so I've had other other clients I've worked with who have won awards. Um, so I'm very excited to work with. Um, with uh, and mentor other screenwriters who are looking to take their work to the next level. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's what I encourage. Awesome, and you won you won quite a few contests yourself, right? From yeah, I, man, I had a, I had right. a huge run. I went around the essentially I went from LA to London with with winning awards. I had a big year, um, and then from that I started shifting into um, really getting stuff made. Uh, so I already had one script. I wrote uh, called Finding Nicole, got produced and, and made. So right now they're shopping it, uh, shopping it around distribution. Um, I had another film that just uh, struck a deal. Uh, so I wrote a spec that got optioned and produced and um, uh, just struck a deal with the network television. So I'm going to have a film on network television. I'm literally not allowed to say anything more than that, but it's 100% legit. So super exciting. My mom cannot contain herself. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, yeah. Congratulations. That's nice. And any, so, yeah, is, there a follow -up? is there a follow-up huh? book in the works? I do, actually. Yeah, I'm actually working on volume two of The Guide for Every Screenwriter. This one will expand into television. So it will be writing for feature and writing for television. Awesome. I awesome. like it. I like it. Yeah, and I, yeah, I, yeah. I remember, I think we had a discussion once about a workbook, man. If you can put together a workbook, that would be pretty cool. I have thought about it. There is, um, there are workbooks out there, though, and they've done, like, a really good job at it. And I'm like, I don't really know. Maybe, maybe, maybe a in the future, I'll, I'll think about a third, a workbook in the future. But I want to get this second book out there. Um, but there are some pretty stellar workbooks out there, so. Awesome. 
If it's not broken, yeah. don't fix it, right? Yeah. I mean, the thing for the guide for every screenwriter is I created something that did not exist. No, there was no reference guide for screenwriting. And I, I even took my book to publishers and I'm like, would you like to publish this book? And they're like, yeah, we're not interested, you know? And I'm like, but this book doesn't exist. And in within the genre, there's a hole I'm filling, which means there's demand. And they go, um, yeah, we don't think it's for, for the screenwriting audience. I'm like, well, I am the screenwriting audience <laughs> and I wrote the book. So I'm pretty sure people want it because like, I know. Um, <laughs> I know. And, and they're and they're like, oh no, we passed. And I was like, okay, just so you know, I'm going to make this a bestseller now. I literally wrote that in the email, and then my wife's like, get it. <laughs> um, and so so then I did. You know, I brought in a publisher, and uh, I self published, and I brought in a, a PR firm, and we went through and and uh, we made it a bestseller. Um, and um, yeah, and it's it's out there, and um, and I'm excited. You know, people like it, and and. Um, Guys like Michael, I've really enjoyed it, and I appreciate that. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure having you as our first Zoom guest. Absolutely. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. I'm excited to, to welcome you guys into the into the podcasting world. And one thing you'll notice is um, your first episode is always your most downloaded, however <laughs> crazy that is. Yep. So it doesn't matter, like, when you're 200 episodes from now, um, people will, will, will watch your first, your 200th episode or whatever episode comes out that week. And they'll be like, oh, I wonder what the first one's like. And they'll go back to it. And they're going to get us guys. They're going to get us talking about all of this stuff. So that's exciting. <laughs> that is definitely. And, and if you're ever in town in New York, the Big Apple, we'll, we'll interview in, you in person. You're welcome to come. Absolutely. Oh, I appreciate that. I will, I will, I will keep that in mind, especially when I, when I get out, up and out of here. Awesome, awesome. Mike, you want to drop any last words? I just wanted to, um, uh, congratulations on, on the TV stuff that's coming out, the new book, good luck. Keep the content coming online. I, I appreciate it and and much success to you. And I, and I you. hope to, um, you know, to get together soon, talk, talk it up again soon. All right, guys, thanks a lot, man. Have a good one. You too, thank you very much. You too, thank you. Jeffrey D. Calhoun. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Peace and love. And remember, if you want to get a girl, you bring her to a scary movie. <laughs> and that's it. She's yours. I'm telling you, man, that's, that's the best advice I gave today. <laughs> no doubt. <no. laughs> All right, dude. Take care. Okay. See you. Bye-bye.